Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm UVA President Teresa Sullivan, and I'm delighted to see you all here for the dedication of this beautiful new building, Skipwith Hall. Peyton Skipwith was an enslaved laborer who quarried stone for construction at the university in the early 19th century. The site on which this building was constructed is believed to be the location of the quarry where stone was mined for use in the academical village and where Mr. Skipwith would have worked. Last September, the Board of Visitors passed a resolution naming this building Skipwith Hall in honor of the work of Peyton Skipwith. I'm especially honored that we have relatives of Mr. Skipwith with us today for this special occasion. A project such as Skipwith Hall requires a lot of hard work from a lot of people. Many people both within and beyond the UVA community have been involved in this project since its earliest stages. I'm grateful for their efforts and I'll mention a few who had significant roles. Senior Vice President for Operations Colette Sheehy and her staff were instrumental in guiding the project to fruition. Many people in facilities management deserve credit including Senior Project Manager Amy Eichenberger and Construction Administration Manager Keith Payne. We want to thank the project's designers, Bowie Gridley Architects. I'm also grateful to the project's construction manager, Crenshaw Construction, and its staff, subcontractors, and advisors. Please join me in a round of applause for all these people. One of the recommendations of the President's Commission on Slavery in the University was to name one or more UVA buildings after enslaved persons who were connected to the life of the university. Two years ago, the university named a dormitory in honor of William and Isabella Gibbons, a married couple who were enslaved here and later became free. This is part of a broad, ongoing effort to recognize the role of slavery in the university's history and to educate the members of our community about the role of enslaved people at UVA as we approach our bicentennial. And now to speak more about this effort and about Mr. Skipwith and his family, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marcus Martin and Kurt Von Dock, the co-chairs of the President's Commission on Slavery and the University. Thank you, President Sullivan. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Marcus Martin. I'm Vice President and Chief Officer for Diversity and Equity, and I'm also a Professor of Emergency Medicine here at the University of Virginia. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. We have uh, a lot of guests, skip with family members. Uh, we have faculty, we have staff and students, uh, we have administrators, we have members of the community, and um, a Board of Visitor member should be here as well. Um, Kurt Von Dyck and I, and Kurt will be coming up in just a minute, we serve as co-chairs of the President's Commission on Slavery and University, and I'm going to abbreviate that for you, PCSU. So when I say PCSU, that's the President's Commission on Slavery and University. Uh, we're truly honored to take part in this dedication of Skipworth Hall, and it's great to see so many people here today on this gorgeous day. President Sullivan established the PCSU officially September 2013 and she appointed 26 people to serve. The commission consists of students and staff, faculty, alumni, and members of the community. And we have a local advisory board, we have a national advisory board, and we have a community relations task force. So we have a lot of people who've been involved since 2013 in helping us. So we thank President Sullivan for establishing the PCSU and for her support of today's event. The PCSU charge is to provide advice on the commemoration of the university's historical relationship with slavery and recommendations on how to best recognize contributions of the enslaved who helped build and maintain the university. As we all know, the enslaved played vital roles in UVA's history, such as Peyton Skipwith's contributions as a master mason, quarrying stone for use in construction of the university right back here, just behind us. Now, we were delighted on September 16, 2016, the Building and Grounds Committee 
with the full support of the Board of Visitors, approved naming this beautiful facilities shop and support an office building skip with hall. So we thank the board for that. Now this is a unique accomplishment as, as Garth Anderson has pointed out. Uh, to our knowledge, no other university has named buildings after a slave master and a slave he owned, as we have named here with Cock Hall and Skip with Hall. So UVA is truly a leader among many universities now studying slavery. And Kurt will mention a little bit about that in just a minute. So we thank uh, the members of the PCSU uh, for their diligent ongoing work of discovery and recognition. And there are a number of our PCSU members, the Community Relations Task Force, or Memorialton, uh, and Slave Laborers Design Team. Please raise your hand, folks out there who are, have been involved uh, with helping the President's Commission of Slavery and University. So we, we thank you. Um, give you a round of applause. <laughs> And in a few minutes, we will be hearing from Professor Randall Miller. Uh, Professor Miller, thank you so much for being here and for your lovely wife being here as well. Linda, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to take this time to thank the facilities management team, uh, Don Sundgren, who's setting up front here, uh, Garth Anderson and Mark Stannis and uh, Jennifer Watson. We met several months ago, almost half a year ago, when we were planning for this particular event. And we also thank Cecil Banks uh, in the president's office. Cecil, thank you. Megan Faulkner, Crystal Clemens, and Michelle Strickland, all in the Office for Diversity and Equity for their help with this event. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank um, Crystal Appia from the University Library Special Collections for spending the time with family members today. I hear that it was an awesome time of reviewing letters today in the library. So thanks, Crystal, for that. So at this time, and I'll come back in just a minute, I'll invite Kurt to come up and give us uh, some background information on some of our accomplishments of the President's Commission on Slavery in the University. Kurt. Good afternoon, and thank, thank you again. I'm not going to repeat all the thank yous that Dr. Martin went, went through, but thank you for coming out here today. This is really exciting. It's an honor to be here today to dedicate Skipwith Hall and briefly speak with you about the work of this 26-member commission. A couple quick plugs. We have a website, slavery.virginia.edu. Please check it out. It details our work, our process, our initiatives, and now it's beginning to detail pieces of the history of slavery at the university. If you are on Twitter, you can also follow us on Twitter at slavery, at slavery UVA, and we have a hashtag, this is all new to me, slavery UVA. So we tweet regularly about history of enslavement here. And I found out that it's actually kind of fun and interesting. So uh, good thing to check out. I wanted to run through kind of a brief list of all the things we've been doing. Um, the Cavalier Daily will probably write a great article about this tomorrow and tell us you're not doing enough and you're not doing it fast enough. So I like to take these moments to remind everyone of what we've actually done because they're right, we have more to do. So first, in 2014, we uh, were involved in the dedication and interpretation of the African American Cemetery, which is just across the street north of the University Cemetery. This included commissioning the poem Fieldwork by renowned poet Brenda Marie Osbey. We were also involved in the Rotunda renovation project in redesigning the Rotunda Visitor Center. It now includes slavery, the lives of the enslaved, and some artifacts as a component of the interpretive materials there. So we're changing the story we tell about our university and including slavery in that story. We developed in 2016 an African American, enslaved African Americans walking tour map that you can pick up in the Rotunda Visitors Center. It also has an online cell phone audio component through OnCell that will be going live later this year so you can listen to the audio at the various stops. We're also working on a number of other projects around grounds, including uh, putting an interpretive panel on enslaved women at the early university in Levering Hall. This is now the site of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Department, and they asked us if we would do this, and I think it's a great idea. We're working on interpretive panels at the Gooch Dillard Enslaved Cemetery, which is about a half mile in that direction, so there'll be more signage there. And the memorial, again, go to the website, you can 
click on the information about the memorial, but we're in the midst of memorial design process right now. Fundraising is underway. The design team and the commission held community meetings for over three months to get feedback and comments about where the memorial should be, what it should look like, what it should say, and what else we should do. So we continue to engage in pretty aggressive community outreach, and I think it's been very successful. In 2014, we held our first symposium, Universities Confronting Slavery. So we brought in scholars from around the country to talk about this. We're doing that again this fall. This is October 2017. This is Universities, Slavery, Public Memory, and the Built Landscape. And I love this. This is a bicentennial event for the university in partnership with the Slave Dwelling Project, Monticello, Montpelier, Highland, Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, Carter Woodson Institute, and the Now Center for Civil War Studies. So exciting stuff. If you are back here in October, please plan on attending. It's going to be a great event. We are also working on a couple of other projects that I think are really exciting. We created a consortium in 2015 called University Studying Slavery. This is now 24 schools internationally, all with active programs looking at this history. We have several other schools planning on joining, and I'm in conversations with schools on the other side of the Atlantic. So we're now uh, at the tip of the spear on a movement amongst schools nationwide and, again, beyond the US. Really exciting stuff. We last have a curriculum at the university. This was one of the things that came out of the commission's early days. We need to educate our students, and we can do this by naming buildings, by putting up interpretive panels and running classes. So we are running for the second time this fall, American Studies uh, 1559, Slavery and Its Legacies. This is a class for first and second year students that brings in a team of faculty. It's about 15 or more professors from 12 different departments and schools lecture over the course of the semester. And we just got approval for a pavilion seminar for spring 2018 that will be a smaller seminar or class where students can dig deeper in research projects of their own design. So the, these classes, we're going to continue to offer them uh, for the foreseeable future. We also, for the second year, are running something called the Cornerstone Summer Institute. This is a summer camp for high school students that focuses on slavery and its legacies, uses UVA in Central Virginia as our case study and laboratory, and we work with Monticello and Montpelier on the educational content, and we offer scholarships for students with demonstrated financial need, particularly those who come from the Central Virginia area. We had 22 students last year. Uh, we're not done accepting applications, but we're uh, well over 30 applicants already this year, so I'm really excited that in June we'll have another group of high school students here, many of whom will return uh, in the next year or the year after to attend UVA as students. So I love this that we're training them before they get here on this important history. And then last two things, we're working with UNESCO and Monticello on a 2018 event here in March that will be about uh, slavery and uh, world heritage sites. And we have a book slated to come out in 2019 that will be the first sustained examination of slavery at the university in print. So thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Martin? Thank you, thank you Kurt. Uh, Kurt mentioned the Cornerstone program. And I think we have a student from last year. Skip with them. Stand up for us so we can see you. She was in the program last year. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, the Skipwith family is well represented here today. Uh, we have descendants of Peyton Skipwith's siblings. The Creasy family is descended from Peyton's sister Lavinia Ann, and the Malones, Yorks, and Branches are descendants of Peyton's brother George. George's daughter Lucy is the great-great-great-grandmother of Carol Malone and Bill York. Lavinia Ann is the great-great-grandmother of Joe Creasy. Other family member last names here include Thomas, Wilson, Morton, Johnson, Huddleston, and Van Gogh. The families represented here today came from a distance, some as far as Ohio, to be with us. And we're truly grateful for your presence and willingness to participate and share your remarkable family history with us today. So I'd like to ask all the family members to stand up right now, please, and we will give you a big applause. The 
This is awesome. This is the beginning of uh, many more reunions we'd like to have here at the University of Virginia. And now I'm going to ask uh, three of the family members, Carl Malone, I see Carl over there, come up, and Joe Creasy and Bill York. Uh, they will come up and take a few minutes to give some comments on behalf of the Skipworth family and certainly correct me on anything that I may have misspoken. So please come on, come on up. Yes, please. Carl, Carl please come on up. Thanks. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, faculty members and friends, I am here with family members Debbie Johnson, Sylvia Johnson, Lois Branch, and Daryl Branch. On behalf of all Skipworth descendants, I want to thank you for honoring our ancestor today. In 1986, I was discovered by Mr. Miller's book, and since that moment, the history and legacy of our ancestors continues to unfold. We must continue to educate our family about our history and the sacrifices and accomplishments of our ancestors. I have envisioned this moment many times. I'm so happy to see you, and I'm so happy to be with you. Let's make an effort to stay connected. Peyton Skipwith and his family spirit brought us together. Let's continue to build upon his legacy. Thank you. Mr. Joe Creasy, come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Creasy, and, and I am a descendant of Peyton Skip with Sister Lavinia, my great, great, great grandmother. I want to speak very briefly to represent the Skip with Creasy family group at this ceremony. First, let me say to President Sullivan, the head of this great university, we sin sincerely appreciate what you, your staff, and other partnering organizations have done to make this occasion come to fruition. This event has historical significance. Not only is it personally significant to us as family, but we also realize the impact the university is projecting in terms of this push towards inclusive diversity by its recognition of all those who established the university from its beginnings long ago. And in this case, here today, the recognition of one of those individuals who literally helped to build it. This is the legacy that you bestow upon Uncle Peyton skip with today. And it is so fitting that you chose to do so uh, as you celebrate your 196th Founders Day and the birthday of the university's founder, Thomas Jefferson. I need to mention that the Creasy family is also represented here today by the first Creasy family student at UVA, Dwayne Creasy, Jr. Please stand. We challenge you, we challenge you, Dwayne, to complete your studies here, go forth, and make your mark in the world stage, on the world stage, such that this university may one day dedicate a hall in your honor. <laughs> That's a tall order. It's a tall order for you, but it is also achievable. Achievable more so for you than it was for Uncle Peyton. In closing these remarks, let me say what Uncle Peyton might have said, which is reflective of his steadfast Christian beliefs 
as gleaned from his famous letters chronicle in the book, Dear Master. Quote, I shall meet you where we shall be blessed forever through endless days. Before I sit, I want to very briefly acknowledge a dear friend of me and my family group who is responsible for introducing me to Uncle Peyton as well as my great-great-grandfather, Ben Creasy, through her extensive research culminating in a book titled, The Slaves Have Names. Please stand, Andy. This is Andy Kumbo Floyd. For those of you who would like to learn a bit more about the Skipwiths and the lives of others at the Bremo Plantations in Fluvanna County, Virginia, I asked Andy to bring a few of her books to make them available to you if you are interested. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Now we'll ask Mr. Bill York to come forward. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, the entire University of Virginia staff responsible for making this opportunity available to me. When I first heard of it, I uh, thought of my mother, who was a school teacher. Uh, she gave us this book back in 1990. And um, I read through it. And I wondered, what if anything would happen except that someone will remember that there was a name, a man named Peyton. As things developed, it brought a family together who had otherwise not really known the virtues of we are, you see. I wrote something that says, I took a picture of a door at Bremo because Andy and her father brought my family together to come and visit Bremo years ago. And I took some pictures and I took one of the pictures of a door that was made by slaves and I wrote it that, Lord, help me to know who you is, who I is, whose I is, and where you is. And I remember showing that to someone at church, and they didn't know what the door meant. It was a door into freedom. It was a door that was made by slaves who had no idea that someone would remember. And then I told them, if the grammar bothers you, you should read, Dear Master, because when you get past the fact that intellectually it doesn't please you, you might realize that you missed the point. You see, Peyton didn't have a minute, and neither did Lucy, to wonder if someone would edit this and make sure that it was acceptable to intellectuals throughout the world. <laughs> they were busy making history, not writing it. When I read it, I immediately chose to look into Ancestry.com because there was so much that Randall put in there and yet so much that left me hungry that I wanted to see if anyone else remembered that there was a man named Peyton. I wondered if anybody knew that Lucy demonstrated what just a little intellectual exposure can do with someone with creativity and a commitment. I asked my 95-year-old grandmother, Maddie Skipwith, if she remembered someone named Lucy Skipwith, and she said in a quick note, you mean Mama Lucy? <laughs> I didn't know that was Mama Lucy. <laughs> and she said, yes, and I said, tell me about it. And she told me, I'm 95 years old, try not to ask for details. <laughs> I discovered that the name Lucy had been recycled. It seems that while some people intellectually knew what these names meant, the way people in the Skipwith clan kept it alive was they kept putting it on one generation and another to say, one day you might learn what this name means, but each of you is charged with giving it meaning greater than you learned. 
My grandfather's mother's name was Lucy Skipwith. My mother's name was Sarah Skipwith. She had eight brothers and sisters. My, father, my grandfather's name was Sam Skipwith. His grandfather, his father's name was William Skipwith. His mother's name was Lucy Skipwith. Lucy Wynn Skipwith. When I went into Ancestry.com, I immediately, through census 1880 to 1900, 19, I found my family. And when I read the book and I saw locations that I didn't know, I only had to look at the census that said his father was born in Mississippi. His mother was born in Alabama. You see, I was able, and with my, my beautiful wife, we were able to draw strings between all of these. And then I did the, um, the DNA. Now, I've been told all my life that I was African American, because I used to be colored, and then I was black, and then I became African. <laughs> but one of the things that I've been told is that we had Native American bloodline. And so you can imagine that when I got my DNA results, I kept looking for Cherokee Indians. <laughs> Apparently, they didn't keep good books. <laughs> what I did discover is that the, the names, the locations that were mentioned in the books, the locations that were mentioned in these official documents uh, in the federal government, they said that I'm 41% African of, the, of Ghana, and Ivory Coast. I'm 24% British, 7% Irish, and the balance is a mixture of other things. I would imagine the Native Americans were there. But what was very interesting to me is as I looked at that, I had been to all of the places, save one, that were mentioned in the book, all of the places that were mentioned in the documentation and I had gone there without knowing that I had a true line there. So when you guys did what it is you do, you stimulated such family interests that we began to talk to each other. We began to search. We began to have conversations. And I'll leave you with this. When I read that Lucy Skipwith was lost to history after the emancipation, I was talking to a cousin who said, Oh, you mean Mama Lucy? That's the second time I'd heard that. Well, actually, she wasn't lost. She was lost to slavery. Hmm? She was lost to being someone's victim. But she did quite well after slavery. And then I realized that I had been to the place where she lived. I, had, I had learned that my mother had taken us to all of these places without the story, without the book. And it's amazing what happens when you raise children, you give them input as they grow. And at some point, they visit events in life and they don't know what to do and they look into their travel bag and say, that's what daddy meant. That's what mom, you guys and what you have done have given legitimacy to the, situ to the consideration that if you learn, if you believe, and if you're faithful, you will discover who you are. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you to all the Skip with family members who spoke and who are here. Uh, now we'll ask Garth Anderson to come up and introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Miller to you all. Professor Miller. Uh, received his baccalaureate degree from Hope College and his master's and PhD from Ohio State University. He is the William Dirk Warren 50 sesquicentennial uh, chair and professor of history at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. Professor Miller is the author or editor of numerous books which treat such various topics as African American culture and life, slavery, religion, social reform, popular culture, politics, the Civil War and Reconstruction, the ethnic and immigrant history. He co-edited the award-winning Dictionary of Afro-American Slavery. Selected other books include Religion and the American Civil War, 
the birth of the grand old party, the Republicans' first generation, Lincoln and leadership, military, political, and religious decision-making, and Onto a Good Land, A History of the American People. Professor Miller has also authored more than 80 articles and essays. He is the former editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, the co-editor of Pennsylvania, A History of the Commonwealth, and is currently co-editor of the Digital Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia. He is past president of the Pennsylvania Historical Association and has served on the boards of various historical humanities and museum organizations, including the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. Currently, he sits on the boards of Cliveden of the National Historic Trust, the Library Company of Philadelphia, and the Abraham Lincoln Foundation of the Union League of Philadelphia, as well as the um, organization Historians Against Slavery. Professor Miller has been a consultant for and appeared in documentaries on American culture and history, the Civil War, politics, religion, African-American culture and life, slavery, Philadelphia life and politics, as well as many other topics. He is co-editor of Southern Descent series at the University of Virginia Press and is co-editor of the Slavery Since Emancipation series at Cambridge University Press. But the publication that brings Professor Miller here today is his acclaimed book, Dear Masters, Letters of a Slave Family. Originally published by the Cornell University Press in 1978, then revised and expanded in the University of Georgia Press release of 1990. Forty years ago, the voices of Peyton Skipwith and other members of the family sat silently as correspondents in books at the university's special collections. With the publication of Dear Master, they were awakened. And with the scholarly editing provided by Professor Miller, the first person narratives from Liberia and the Alabama plantations tell remarkable stories about remarkable people. Our Proctor's papers document that Peyton Skipwith cut stone for the anatomical theater. Skipwith Hall sits on the site of the university quarry where we believe he and his team worked and it is important to recognize his contribution to the building of Jefferson's academical village. But Peyton also had a very well documented life after his manumission. Peyton, his wife and six children were emancipated by John Hartwell Cock in 1833 and were transported to Liberia to begin their new life beyond the bonds of slavery. Peyton was literate thanks to the schooling provided to many slaves on Cock's Brimo plantation. Peyton's letters to his former owner comprise a section of Professor Miller's Dear Master and we learn directly from Peyton of his losses, problems, faith, acceptance of his new home, love of family, and his active participation in the formation of the country of Liberia. Both as an artisan working in Virginia and as a contributor to the emerging country of Liberia, we can appreciate Peyton Skipwith as a historic figure. Thank you for that, Dr. Miller, and welcome. Well, uh, I'm going to get pretty emotional. Uh, we historians, uh, we live in the past, but we understand the past has never passed. Uh, we get to know people in the past better than we get to know people in our own day, even ourselves. Uh, I got to know the Skipwiths. I got to know them as people by reading their accounts but they never died, they were never gone. <laughs> Let me get pretty emotional. And I know that to be a truth in many ways, and I'll say something about it, but I know it to be a truth because of today, because of you. My, no, it's so cool, it's cool. <laughs> My wife keeps telling me, you gotta get more emotional, you gotta show yourself. <laughs> 
And I keep, and I, and I tell her, look at me, I got a button down shirt. Uh, <laughs> I don't get emotional, I'm supposed to be cool. But I am emotional because not only did I get to know them, I got to know you. And Carol Malone said a beautiful thing and did a beautiful thing when she adopted me into the Skip With family. So I've had two great honors in my life in terms of being accepted. One was being taken in by my wife's family. Now it's being taken in by yours. Thank you. Now I'm a historian, so I'm gonna say a few things in this dedication. I'd actually written them out, which is a good thing, so I can hold myself together. And, and, and I'm a historian, so I'm, I'm gonna talk like a historian, uh, which is what people pay me to do. <laughs> the dedication of this building and indeed, this occasion is more than the recognition of a remarkable man. It signals a major development underway at the University of Virginia and indeed in America to rethink and rewrite our history by looking deep into our institutions and ourselves to discover our complicity with slavery and from that to consider what obligations we owe because of that history. Dedicating this building follows three years of intensive research by Garth Anderson and others at the university committed to getting the fullest possible and truest story about the university's origins. That investigation and this dedication point to the possibility, indeed the necessity, of claiming a new, more inclusive identity and a more honest engagement with our past. It's an important reason why we're here today. In the past 10 years or so, many universities have been confronting the painful facts of their entanglement with slavery. And what that tells them, not only about their own complicity in a great human wrong, but also in their blindness to such a past for so long. Following a lengthy report by Brown University in 2006 that laid out the school's investigation of a slave past, which included the acknowledgement that money from slave trading made possible the very existence of the school, other schools took up, uh, took up the challenge the Brown report made to do their own self-searching of their records and of their very souls to get the truth of their past and make that past known and usable. The Brown Report concluded that, concluded that, and I'm quoting, if this nation is ever to have a serious dialogue about slavery, Jim Crow and bitter legacies that they have bequeathed to us, then universities must, must provide the leadership. For all their manifold flaws and failings, universities possess the unique concentrations of knowledge and skills. The fact that so many of our nation's elite institutions have histories that are entangled with the history of slavery only enhances the opportunity and the obligation. Schools across the country took up that challenge, the University of Virginia among them. That challenge had gained force through news stories about the ugly facts researchers were discovering in archives and other records, such as Georgetown and uh, learning about the sale of slaves to fund the college and the use of slave labor in the building and maintenance of schools. They demanded that universities come clean with their past. As the role of money could earn from the slave trade, the product of slave labor, and the very sweat and blood of so many enslaved people became known, it was no longer possible to believe the creation stories of university foundings as varieties of immaculate conceptions, or as older histories and public relations would have it. Schools responded. Various consortia formed to share methods, information, and resources to interrogate their histories. We heard about Virginia's key role in that today. And schools such as Columbia University, and I add Virginia as well, developed special courses devoted to investigating and analyzing their slave past. Task forces abounded on college campuses to study the problems. At the same time, students, and students have driven a lot of this. At the same time, students and others called for the defrocking of once admired founders and supporters and alumni whose profits from and support for slavery and whose racial views were too obnoxious to let stand. Like the removal of Confederate monuments, down came the portraits of such men in the hallowed halls and off went their names from the ivied walls. A purging was underway. But that was not enough, for universities needed to do more than scrub the names of such people from public view. They needed to find and present the stories of the enslaved, the free blacks and others who write a new history of to write a new history of inclusion, and admittedly also one of con a contention, and thus awaken and sustain an ongoing investigation and presentation of their true selves. Doing so demanded a significant commitment of resources and reorientation of priorities. It also demanded courage and will. 
In the words of Cray Wilder, whose book Ebony and Ebony, published in 2013, documented many of the nation's most prestigious universities' troubled history with slavery and race, and I'm quoting now, it's a measure of our integrity that we do that. We can't claim to be what we claim to be, institutions that produce knowledge and pursue truths, if we're afraid to pr pursue truths about ourselves. The University of Virginia did not shrink from that obligation. The naming of Peyton Skipwith Hall, among other actions by the university to recover and recognize its troubled history, attests to that. Working through archival and other records, students, staff, and faculty have found that there were at least 5,000 or perhaps as many as 7,000 enslaved persons who worked at the University of Virginia. That number included carpenters, br blacksmiths, brickmakers, and stonemasons, like Peyton Skipwith, who built, improved, and maintained the property. In any given year, perhaps as many as 100 to 150 slaves lived on the grounds, cooking, getting firewood, doing laundry, tidying rooms, cleaning privies, and performing a host of other tasks for the comfort and the well-being of the students and the faculty. Of those many thousands, researchers have recovered the names of over 950 persons in varying degree, and in varying degrees have connected their lives to the university and the larger Charlottesville and Elroy County communities. But those diligent researchers combing through the records have remarked that they have much work yet to do and ask for our support by continuing to ask questions about the past and about what meanings any such past holds for us today and for tomorrow. They want not only to rewrite history, but to make it right and to make it work for right. The early histories of the university describe the work and costs of hiring and owning slaves, but have little to say about the slaves as people. They hardly know their names. The focus, rather, has been on the architects and the owners, Jefferson, Cock, Cavill, and others, who designed the school and got all the credit for creating and constructing it. The narrative that emerged from such accounts is one of Virginian, by implication American, architectural genius adapting classical styles to speak for the ambitions of a new republic. What was built in stone and brick asserted that the young, untried nation would not collapse into democratic anarchy and cultural barbarism, as Europeans suggested it surely would but rather that the university landscape and structure heralded a new age of Republican virtue. It was, after all, Jefferson's university with all the pride and promise that came from being cast as the offspring of the sage of Monticello. And just as the history of Monticello, the White House, or any other of the great estates of America's founding generation bespoke that genius, so too did the university. But in this history, blacks had no place except perhaps as supposedly docile and doting servants of these great men. Or so the story went for many generations. No more. Now suspect are the old histories that left slaves and free blacks out of the picture, or only in its shadows and margins, and thus distorted and denied the centrality of slavery in creating the university, underwriting it, sustaining it, the upsurge of interest in African-American history since the 1960s and the recognition by historians of the ways slavery literally made the United States and then almost undid it, and the many ways whites north and south profited from slavery and the subjugation of black and other dark peoples. All this now point to the necessity of investigating every manner of institution to discover what role slavery played in its origin and life. Add to this the race-conscious agency of students, staff, and faculty at various universities to know the truth about their schools, that seek their loyalty, with echoes of freedom now from the days of SNCC and Freedom Summer or to the raised fists of Black Lives Matter today. In all this, there is no escaping history. The new historians have demonstrated that slavery begat the universities and kept them beholden to it. Indeed, in the new accounting, universities were places where slaveholders displayed their wealth and asserted their claims to aristocracy by supporting the schools and sending their sons there, and where faculty members wrote apologies for slavery. Who but the slaves built Rome, slavery's apologists asked in justifying slavery as a positive good. Such men defended slavery vigorously and regarded the university and the slaveholding republic that they sought to realize as fulfilling God's command for an ordered and patriarchal world of white over black, man over woman, parent over child. In the end, they were willing to die for that belief. Many did. So the histories tell us, the new histories tell us, just so for the University of Virginia. That new perspective on and understanding of slavery's place in the university and the nation's history also became the interest of the University of Virginia when its students, staff, and faculty demanded the truth about their own school. They set to work to find that history, and through digging and records discovered and then detailed, as in the exhibit we had up in the uh, special collections of the Skipwith letters, 
They discovered a new narrative that acknowledges not only slavery's grip on the school, but also the importance of the enslaved as builders and sustainers of the school and as real people, rather than bookkeeping entries on cost sheets or symbols of a supposedly satisfied servitude. Such interest and effort brings us here today to dedicate a building to an enslaved person and thereby to give him and all the others like him who built the university something of their due. One might fairly ask what Peyton Skipwith and now the naming of a hall after him have to do with all this. To address that question, we should get to know the man. Born sometime in 1800 or thereabouts, Peyton Skipwith was in law the slave of John Hartwell Cock, one of the founders and architects of the university. He was trained as a stonemason. And when, and, when not build, and when not building the now famous and remarkable stone structures at Cox Flavana County plantations, he was hired out for periods of a month to a year for various projects, including the James River Canal, to, uh, building the James River Canal, public works in Lynchburg, private houses and businesses, and the university where he queried stone for constructing the academic village, especially the anatomical theater. A sober and skilled worker, Peyton Skipwith earned praise for his work and his personal habits. Cock respected him, too, as a devout Christian who practiced temperance and a man of uncommon integrity and intelligence. And he set to prepare Skipwith and his family and the others of his slaves for manumission. Through the good example of Peyton Skipwith, Cock hoped to encourage others of his slaves to earn their freedom. He taught Peyton Skipwith and his family members and some other slaves to read and write and set them, set them on a course of working toward repaying their costs so they might be freed and sent to Liberia. Leaving America was always a condition of Cox's plan for manumission, for like Jefferson and others of his class, he could not imagine a biracial America of free blacks and whites. In 1833, Cox did free Peyton Skipwith and his immediate family with promises of doing so for others and sent them off to Liberia. Until his death in 1849, Peyton Skipwith kept up a correspondence with Cox and through him with family members. That correspondence, samples of which are in the library exhibit and the collection and all the letters themselves that we know of um, in the uh, Cock papers and elsewhere in the collection, constitutes the largest single epistolary record of an enslaved and formerly enslaved family anywhere. It is how we have come to know Peyton Skipwith like no other such person. In his letters and in his life, Peyton Skipwith bespoke the, str the struggles of becoming free and owning himself. His wife and one of his children died soon after the family arrived in Liberia. Skipwith and his surviving children found life hard in a new and strange land, surrounded, as he wrote, by savages and cut off from the only land he knew. He wanted to return to America, but over time he adapted to Liberia and then became committed to it. As a stonemason, he got much work in Monrovia, where people build American-style houses and public buildings with stone to protect against the elements and termites and he became involved in civic and political affairs through his service in the militia, fighting the natives and sitting on a petty jury. He bought property and put up a house. He schooled his children. He remarried. He supported his church in a Sunday school. He engaged in public affairs. In Liberia, he built a life, but also a nation. And within a few, in several years, he no longer wanted to return to America. He was now a new man making a new republic, a black republic, that in its success might encourage manumissions in America and bring Christianity and, he said, civilization to Africa. His letters were his lifeline to supplies and information from Cock and Virginia as means of relating what it now meant to be free. It is appropriate that the university named a building after Peyton Skipwith, for he embodied the history of its early construction and its very purpose. He queried, cut, and laid the stones there, here, for a new school in a new nation. He would do likewise in Liberia. He believed in education as essential for freedom and reading the Bible to know God's word and promise and in reading newspapers, contracts, tracts, and anything else that might make him master of his own world. He knew that learning demanded constancy, just as in cutting and laying stone something that, to build something that would last. He found his own way to freedom, initially in his master's terms, but in the end in his own. He was in all that quintessentially true American whatever restrictions and prejudices denied him such recognition in his day. In naming the building for him, we recognize his life, but also what he represents in a larger sense. But the story does not, must not end there. Naming the building for an enslaved person should move us to think not only about Peyton Skip with the man, but also about all the others who worked at the universities whose names we do not know. Perhaps we will never know. It should make us ask not only about them, but all like them 
across the long history of the university and even to, especially to today. Do we know those who do the cooking, the laundry, the cleaning, and so much more that make living and learning at the university possible? Do we know their names? Do we want to know them? Seeing Peyton Skipwith's name in a building and learning about him and others like him should help us appreciate the intelligence and skills of people we see only as hired help if we see them at all. It should cause us to consider their lives and aspirations and our obligations to them. Naming Peyton Skipwith Hall is also part of a process whereby the university is remaking its history by remaking its landscape. The university understands that doing so, they, uh, doing so means, I can't even read my own writing. The university understands that doing so means that there must be more than only one place where slavery and the enslaved are recognized, lest they remain segregated and apart from the university's identity. In other schools, there is some emphasis on tearing down monuments and memorials that celebrate slaveholders and those who profited from human bondage and replacing them with monuments and memorials to the enslaved, free blacks, and abolitionists, and thereby creating a new landscape. Arguments abound in the issue, with some critics insisting that erasing one history to replace it with another cheats a true engagement with a troubled past, and so on. But here at the university that Peyton Skipwith and thousands like him helped to build and maintain, there will be many reminders of a once lost history in cleaning up and marking the places in the cemetery where some of the enslaved are buried, in marking the places where blacks worked or lived, in crafting new courses on the university's history, in collecting and displaying the things blacks made and made useful, in reading and discussing their writings, in naming buildings for them, and so much more. By its pervasiveness and, in many, and its many forms, that new landscape will not allow anyone to escape history. All this will raise a consciousness and even stir conscience by quickening and thickening our awareness and knowledge of the many ways blacks made and make the university. It will make this building a living testimony to that new history and sensibility, and it will ensure that the pursuit of that new history is organic and ongoing. And in all this, it will require that the university also listen to and learn from what people make, it of it all, make of it all. Just as Peyton Skipwith and other builders of the university could not know how the institution would grow, dare we say evolve, as different people gave new meanings to it, so too with memorials and monuments. Here one might think of Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., which critics early on dismissed as so much polished stone with no representation of soldiers supposedly necessary to draw people to it, but soon, which became almost a sacred shrine as people came to it as a place of reflection. Seeing one's own image reflected in the stone, etched with the names of those lost to war, but now reclaimed in memory and memorial, evoked powerful feelings of spiritual recovery and renewal and of history. So it might be with a building such as this, especially if it is part of that larger new landscape, that new history being made today. Peyton Skipwith, the stonemason who, build, who helped build a school and then a nation would understand that. I hope that we might too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Miller. I think we've all benefited from having the opportunity to hear from you. Now I would like to ask Dr. Martin, Mr. Von Doc, to come up here and we will unveil this plaque. I invite you to come up later and see the plaque, but here is what the writing on the plaque says. Peyton Skipwith, 1800 to 1849. Peyton Skipwith was an enslaved master mason who quarried stone for use in construction at the University of Virginia. Mr. Skipwith was owned by John Hartwell Cook, a member of the Board of Visitors. 
Mr. Cook taught Mr. Skipwith to read, write, and perform arithmetic, and also taught him about the Christian faith. Mr. Skipwith was emancipated in 1833, along with his wife and six children. Mr. Cook provided the Skipwith family transit to Liberia, an American colony set up for the repatriation of slaves and free blacks. Skipwith Hall was constructed to house administrative offices for facilities management. The site of this building is believed to be the location of the university quarry where Mr. Skipwith was a laborer. And now I would like to welcome Darlene Van Gogh, a relative of Mr. Skipwith, to the stage for a special musical performance. Thank you to Ms. Van Gogh for that lovely performance. And thanks to all of you for coming this afternoon for this special occasion. I hope you will join me for a reception. And also, the building is open for you to go and tour. And I know everyone would like to show off the building and have you have an opportunity to see it. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.